Good morning, everybody. I'm Zach Blanchard, and this is Political Brew. I'm joined by our analyst, Republican Ray Richardson, and a new addition, lawyer and former Democratic state lawmaker, Cynthia Dill. Good morning to you both. We have a lot to get to today, but first, in Portland, city leaders still cannot find solutions for the homelessness issue. This week, councilors struck down a move that would have added 50 more beds to the city's homeless services center. Meantime, another sweep of an encampment on state property is set for November 1st. Governor Janet Mills was in Portland for a housing conference and toured one of the sites this week. We can't simply reinstitutionalize people as we did 50 years ago. We have to give them, offer them the services we have and hopefully make them productive citizens of the state again. Right, I want to start with you. This is obviously a really complex issue, but politically speaking, it's really a lose-lose for Governor Mills. Yeah, well, I don't think we should be looking at this politically. And the fact of the matter is, I don't think the government can solve it anyhow, or maybe don't e they don't even want to. It's, uh, it's a difficult place. We are literally forming a coalition right now, a private sector co coalition of business leaders, community leaders, churches, and we're gonna say, look, enough of this. These are human beings, these are God's children. Jesus said in the good book, whatever you do to the least of these, you do unto me. So this isn't right. They're sleeping in the mud and the blood, they're drug addicted, they have mental illness. Salt Lake City attacked this problem a number of years ago. They got chronic homelessness down to 4%, which is astonishing in a city that size. And they did it by the government basically getting out of the way and letting the good people of the community who care about this issue. Since we've announced that we're doing this, we've had over 150 people step forward and say, I don't know what to do, but if you'll tell me, I'll do it. We're gonna push the churches to really get involved in this mission and do the work of God, which is what they're called to do. But Cynthia, shouldn't this fall on the government in some form? I think the government's role is to enforce the rules and the laws that we have. And in the case of Portland and the encampments, I think there's a lot of business owners and a lot of neighbors of these encampments that are really feeling the pressure and want the government to step in and do its role in terms of public safety and law enforcement. And I agree with Ray that we certainly have to look to other members of the community to chip in and contribute uh, services and, and the stuff that people need, but the government's role primarily is to set policy and to enforce the law, and I think that's all we can expect of, of the governor at this point with respect to the, the encampments in Portland. All right, and while we're, well, oh. I was just gonna say, and I'm not blaming Governor Mills for this, the bottom line here is we're trading geography for these people. We move one encampment and then they reform somewhere else. This is wrong, and I think maybe we can't solve the problem, but we're gonna take a hard run at it. All right, while we're on the topic of some local city politics, there's some drama in Lewiston. A handful of counselors are being accused of breaking state open meeting laws by meeting privately outside of council chambers. The city's mayor says it's about principle, but those accused say this is a political ploy. Cynthia, on the surface, it seems this group of more conservative members, do you agree that this is purely political? You know, it's hard to tell, but I do think that the the state's uh, freedom of access and sunshine laws are often used as weapons. And in this case, it seems like there was a group that went out for a beer to talk about the upcoming election and being called out by their political opponents. I'm not sure what the harm is. And I'm not sure that the strict application of the state's meeting law applies in this instance. I'm just concerned that the law that was intended to provide transparency in government is used, unfortunately, to silence people and, and, and just used as a weapon to, to prevent people from conversing, which is un-American in my view. Right? Yeah, I'm respectfully, I'm gonna disagree with my friend Cynthia. Mm. Look, if you're gonna to gather together and talk about city business, and they talked about a lot of different stuff according to sources, this should be in the sunshine. These people ran for office, they sought the job, they're talking about city business, they gathered together at uh, the cage or whatever it's called, and it's just wrong. Sunshine is the greatest disinfectant we can have in politics. And any time they gather together and talk about any kind of business, the people ought to know what they're saying. Yeah. The thing is, is that, you know, deep down, we have a fundamental right as Americans to associate and to converse and to, and to talk. And the fact that you can get this idea that it's transaction business when you're, con you know, conversing, I think is where I disagree. If there's votes taken, if there's agreements made, that's business. If it's just a conversation in, in advance of an election about whether this person is gonna be a better candidate than that person or how this person is gonna fit into our group of candidates, it seems to me that should be allowed. We should be encouraging people to converse and try to solve problems and not trying to silence them using these, these laws. All right. 
The Biden administration has announced that it is waiving 26 federal laws in South Texas in order to allow construction of the border wall to resume. The new wall, originally proposed by U.S. Customs and Border Protection this past summer, will add up to 20 miles to the existing wall. Now, funding for the construction comes from federal funds appropriated back in 2019. Ray, this is quite the reversal for the Biden administration. Well, it is and it isn't because uh, Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas came back and said, no, you all kind of misread what we did. We're not really going to be building massive walls. And the president came out and said, well, this funding was appropriated in 2019. We can't change it, all of which is untrue. One Congress is not bound by another. Cynthia, you served in the legislature. You know, a prior legislature can't bind you unless... Uh, it's a constitutional yeah, amendment. But people are looking at the fact that President Biden on the campaign yeah, trail right, sure. said, I'm not going to add to the border wall. Absolutely. Right? And so, again, he said it was immoral to have a wall. So now he's taking on an immoral act. This is all crazy. We've had uh, last year we had 2.31 million people come across the border illegally. We have a clear crisis there. When Trump talked about the wall in 16, I initially thought it was a metaphor for border security. But it worked. We had immigra illegal immigration down to a trickle compared to what it is now. I think that's why this is happening, really. Cynthia? I don't think Joe Biden is going to lose any votes over his extending the wall project that Donald Trump started. And whether it's because he has to under the law, whether the Congress can bind him or not, people want solutions to mm -hmm. the border crisis. And I think no one is going to oppose taking this step. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a headline, of course, because there was a campaign promise about not building the wall. But I think Democrats and, and Republicans are united in trying to find a solution to the migrant crisis and are probably applauding Joe Biden, whether it's publicly or, or, or you know, in their own minds, for, for, for taking action because people are desperate for action. And this is action. I said on Thursday, if the president would just come forward and say, look, I got into office, the problem was much larger than I realized. We're taking these actions. I would have applauded him, and I'm not a Biden fan. Some huge news in Congress this week with the removal of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. The Office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. Speaker McCarthy was voted out this week, the first time this has ever happened in U.S. history. Eight Republicans voted to have him removed. The rest of those votes came from Democrats. Already, Representative Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan have announced their candidacy. Cynthia, obviously this is all in retaliation for the shutdown debacle, but what does this mean for the Republicans or really democracy as a whole? Well, what's really interesting is that the Speaker McCarthy was really pilloried by his fellow Republicans for joining with Democrats to prevent the government shutting down. And then those same Republicans stood with Democrats to oust him from his position. So there's, <laughs> I mean, the drama in the House of Representatives, there's just no end. And I thought what was particularly interesting was Nancy Mace, the Republican from South Carolina, who uh, was a very surprise, you know, was a huge surprise and, and, and demonstrates that the speaker's support in large part was undermined by the appearance that he's not trustworthy. Yeah, yeah. Ray, what do you think about the mess? So, first of all, I'm no fan of McCarthy. I predict this in January when he emptied the cupboard and basically get elected. When you covet something so desperately as McCarthy did to be speaker, this was bound to happen. His reputation in Washington is he'll make a deal with you, Zach, and then he'll go over to Cynthia and make another deal, and her deal will contradict yours, and then he'll lie to you that he did it. That's his reputation in Washington. Here's the problem. You can't govern when one person can vote to oust the speaker, and that's really what he agreed to when he became speaker. They didn't throw him out because he's charged with corruption or that he's having an affair with a staff member. They threw him out because he's mad at him. They're mad at him. You can't do that. You can't govern that way. That's not the way we're set up. I'm no fan of McCarthy. Frankly, I'm glad he's gone. I wish he had never been there. But you can't govern doing it this way. Shifting gears now back here in Maine. We all know the state is experiencing a housing crisis, but a new report shows just how bad it is. The study was released by Maine Housing and other agencies, and it found most Maine households cannot afford the median price of a home in the state. The study details households in Maine need to make more than $100,000 a year to afford that median home price. It also shows Maine will need nearly 80,000 more homes by the year 2030. That's counting for the state's current shortage and expected population growth. Ray, this report was released for a big conference in Portland, um, worked by the governor's office to assess just how bad this is. The question now, though, is how do they fix it? Well, number one, builders tell me all the time, because we talk about construction and housing issues here, 
that there are too many rules and regulations. They believe they need rules, they need, believe they need regulations, but it takes forever. A guy called into my show today and he's a, he's a contractor. He says, it takes 30 days to get a permit just to build a deck. That's gotta stop. It's just crazy. I mean, the other piece of it is 37.5% of Maine households are using credit cards to pay their bills right now. We need to lower the tax burden in this state. We're number three in the country. Get closer to New Hampshire, which is the fourth lowest. We're the third highest. That's one thing. But we've got to build more housing stock. The reason the price is so high is we have so much demand and very little supply. So we need to make we need to stop making it so doggone hard to build. Still have rules, still have standards. But it's just crazy to put, to put concrete in the ground. Builders say it's such a difficult process. Yeah. Cynthia? You know, it, I saw the report and I was like, oh great, another report. I mean, we all pretty much know what's in this report. And I think a lot of people are frustrated that what the government's solution has been so far is just a series of reports on how bad the situation is. We've spent so much money studying the issue. And a lot of people, I think, would argue, me included, is that the government's role in this instance is, is to identify the problem, there's a housing shortage, and then get out of the way, as Ray said. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we, in my view, we're doing too much to try to create new zoning and new low-income housing when what we really should be doing is sort of, you know, taking apart some of these laws that are just constricting the private market from building the housing that we need. So but there's a house- argue that we should be encouraging that low-income housing, affordable housing being built as well. We, we, we should certainly be encouraging it, but at the same time, we don't need you know, more and more reporting on, on it. I think the government has a lot of money right now and they have nowhere to spend it. All right, finally, winners and losers. Ray, we'll start with you. No losers. We're Mainers and Americans, so we're winners. But more importantly, since I was in seventh grade, October is my favorite month of the year. I actually wrote a poem to it this year. I am so grateful October is here, the beautiful colors, the crisp air. There's no loser here. All right, Cynthia. I would say Kevin McCarthy is the loser this week. I mean, a big loser, and it's unfortunate because he squandered an opportunity. If he had cut a deal with Hakeem Jeffries, maybe he would still be the speaker. And the winner, if I may, yes. for me this week, is the Pope. I think it's great. I don't know if you heard that he's convening a synod in Rome that is including for the first time women as long as bishops and lay people to talk about some of the social issues and to hopefully be a more inclusive church, which I think is great. Go Pope Francis. Great. Thank you both. If you like Political Brew, odds are you'll catch Meet the Press later this morning with the new moderator, Kristen Welker. I got the chance to sit down with her this week to talk about the current state of affairs. Obviously, 2024 is literally Ooh. right around the corner. Yes. We're likely to see a Trump-Biden rematch. Do you feel the weight of that? I do. I think that, you know, I've covered the Trump administration, the Biden administration, so I have a unique perspective. I obviously moderated the last debate of the 2020 election cycle. And I, I do think that I and all journalists across this country have a huge responsibility. And part of that is, again, making sure that we're keeping our finger on the pulse of what voters care about. Yeah, and in a state like Maine, um, a, a state that split its yes. electoral votes uh, last go round, uh, that is very divided, um, but also has a lot of moderate voters. Uh, what are you doing to kind of make sure you're reaching them? Well, I think that a part of that is just getting out on the road, talking to moderate voters in Maine and all across this country. And I have been talking to voters and they feel so frustrated that there aren't more options. So I think that's going to be a really important component for us to keep in mind as we cover this race. And it does raise questions about how seriously some of these voters may take a third party candidate. So that could be an interesting X factor. Of course, we'll have to see what happens in that regard, but this is going to be uh, an incredibly um, significant, I think, moment in our political history. You can watch more of my interview with Kristen Welker on New Center Maine Plus. And before we go, we want to let you know there is a Voice of the Voter Forum this week with the five candidates running for Portland mayor. You can watch it on air and online Thursday at 7 right here on New Center Maine. The Morning Report is back right after this.